am delighted to be the chair of the first departmental seminar this term. And I am delighted to introduce Irina Nikolaeva to you, our head of department. And I'm sure that you all know Irina, and I think that you all know how research active Irina is. And in fact, she has just finished the book, and we are going to launch, it's going to be launched next week. And it is called Typo Typology and Linguistic Theory, Descriptive Typology and Linguistic Theory, something like that, and uh, Relative Clauses. Uh, so anyway, so and then if you just look at the website and you go to her home page, you see all the publications. So at one point I thought, you know, what's the point? It's better to give you the reference to her home page and then you can look at, I mean, she publishes an article a day, so there you are. And she has been doing that for years and years. So this is Irina, and today Irina will talk to us. And she's going to be talking about uh, the expression of time on nouns, evidence from two and five minutes. Irina. Thank you very much for this introduction. I have a lot of examples here. That's why I did not prepare the slides. I only have handouts, because there would be too many to put on slides. Um, right. So what I'm going to talk about is the expression of tense aspect mood, or mostly tense and mood, on nominals. And it has been quite widely accepted uh, in linguistics that the temporal interpretation of nominals, or noun phrases if you like, uh, is basically established through the sources outside of the relevant NP. The time at which the noun phrase is true either coincides with the time at which the verb of the clause is true, or it coincides with some con contextually uh, relevant time. Well, if you look at very simple examples in one, uh, the first one, every prisoner is now in jail, uh, the time at which uh, the noun phrase prisoner is true coincides with the time of the main verb. It's, it's now, basically. But if you look at the second one, every fugitive is now in jail, you can see that that's not exactly true, uh, because when you are already in jail, uh, when you are in jail again, you are not a fugitive anymore. So uh, the noun phrase every fugitive was true at some time which is, was uh, before the time of now. That's what we say, that's where we say that the time of the noun phrase is established through uh, some contextually relevant time. Uh, but that's basically true for many languages. However, uh, it has been claimed that in in some languages, the time of the noun phrase can actually be established through the source internal to this noun phrase. So it's somehow uh, expressed within the noun phrase itself, uh, not in the context and no, not in the verb. And there has been a growing body of evidence for the morphology which indicates time on nouns. I, I give some references here. Uh, what it actually means for us, it means we have to uh, decide on the question of categorization. If the nominal is bearing a marker indicating uh, NP internal time, is it a tense marker or not? Or, and if it is a tense marker, is it the same tense marker as the tense on the verb? Can we say that they instantiate the same category? It's just the category of tense in language. And more generally, what do these markers tell us about the way the concept of time is expressed and grammaticalized across languages. So that's basically what I'm going to look at. I have to say that the, this question is highly debatable, but ex, uh, especially the question of category. Um, there is no agreement at the moment whether the nominal tense is the same as the verbal tense. And basically, there are two uh, different positions here. Uh, the first view is, uh, was expressed uh, by a seminal paper by uh, Norlin and Sadler, uh, who talked about uh, nominal tense with nominal scope, as they called it. And they uh, cited a body of evidence from about 15 languages, I think, which do have the expression of nominal tense on argument nouns. And they also uh, cited a few uh, properties of uh, such languages, as you can read here. Uh, in such languages, the nouns show a distinction in tense, and it's very consistent through the whole class. 
and uh, it's not restricted to nominals which function as predicates, main predicates, but it's, uh, it also occurs on argument nouns. And uh, the tense uh, is a morphological category, it's not a syntactic clitic, so it's expressed by some kind of bound morphology, basically. Uh, on the other hand, other people uh, have doubted that nominals can have true tense and said that uh, what these markers are, they're not really tense, they're, they're something else. Uh, in particular, Judith Tonhauser uh, challenged this view that nominals have tense and she said that uh, the evidence we have from the languages which have been investigated from this point of view suggests that uh, these markers do not behave like true tenses on verbs, and therefore they do not deserve to be called tense, tenses. They're, they're, they're something else. And her further claim is uh, there's currently no evidence from any language at all that, uh, lang uh, that languages can have a true category of tense on nominals, on argument nouns and each case is highly individual. So my paper is basically going to contribute to, this, uh, to these debates. I'm going to investigate um, this uh, temporal, presumably, category in Tundra Nenets, and uh, it's very much a work uh, in progress, I have to say. I haven't uh, reached the, the final conclusion on that yet. Uh, but basically what I'm going to suggest in this particular paper is that Tundra Nenets does have some kind of uh, tense-related morphology on nouns, but whether it's actual tense or perhaps mood depends on how we define tense, uh, whether it looks at uh, the predicate internal to the noun phrase or to something um, external to it. Uh, I'll come to that. Okay, so what I'm going to investigate, I'm going to investigate the, uh, the forms in Tundra Nenets, which are traditionally called predestinative forms. That's, that's just the traditional name which is used in descriptive grammars. And uh, you can see an example in two on the next page. So T for me, or meant for me, uh, that's the predestinative phrase. And it basically expresses a two-place relation, X meant for Y, or X, uh, Y's future X. And I will uh, say that the X, the head of the noun phrase itself, that's the actual predestinative noun, and it bears the predestinative uh, suffix, pred, I indicated in glosses, and the element Y, I will call it beneficiary. Uh, it, it can be, uh, in, in this particular example, it's I, and it can be expressed uh, by the bound agreement morphology on the predestinative noun itself, the first person singular in this case, and also possibly by a freestanding pronoun. And I have to say uh, that there are no analysis of uh, these forms in Nenets, but there are uh, analysis uh, for other languages related to Nenets or distantly related and they all claim that uh, what is important here is that the beneficiary can actually correspond to the goal argument of a ditransitive verb. Uh, this you can see in three. So if you have something like I gave you a book the only expression of the recipient argument is by means of this beneficiary. Right? Um, so that's what they uh, looked at and analyzed it from various perspectives. Perspectives, but um, the point here is that it, at least in Nenets, uh, the beneficiary uh, exhibits all the distributional encoding properties of the regular possessor, and it can be shown to be actually internal to the possessive in, uh, possessive NP uh, to the and the same NP where the predestinative noun is. In four, I show the structural parallelism uh, between the predestinative construction and the regular possessive construction in, the, in this language. Uh, for example, if you look at A and B, you can see that A is your boat, and uh, in this case the possessor uh, is expressed by the possessive agreement on the head noun, an optional freestanding pronoun, and both meant for you is exactly the same, except that there is this predestinative morpheme. And, and, and so on. There is a co complete par parallelism between the regular possessive construction and the predestinative construction. Moreover, I'm not going to show it here, but uh, we do have all the syntactic evidence that the predestinative uh, 
that the beneficiary actually does not assume the argument status. It does not show the properties of a direct uh, object or indirect object, but behaves like an NP internal possessor. So there is no real uh, evidence that beneficiary, the beneficiary is the argument of the verb. Most importantly, it does not even have to correspond to the um, goal argument of, of the ditransitive verb. This is shown in five. If you say something like, I gave Masha a book for you, you can see very clearly here that the goal argument uh, is not co-referential with the beneficiary. The beneficiary is you, and the goal argument is, is Masha. So I conclude then that the beneficiary is not an argument of the verb, it remains uh, internal to the noun phrase. Okay. Basically what I'm going to suggest is that the uh, literal, literal translation, there's a handout somewhere there, Lutz, that the literal translation of example three is not I gave you a book, but something like I gave a book, I, I gave you your future book to, uh, with the goal argument uh, remaining unexpressed. And this is perfectly possible in Nenon's grammar. It, 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 it's in the, this is independently attested in the Nenon's grammar. You do not have to express the goal argument, <coughs> argument at all. And in this particular case, it, is, uh, it remains unexpressed, unexpressed. But then there is a certain implicature that it is co-referential with the beneficiary. Okay, so I'm going to look at the, at the syntax and semantics of these forms in more detail, but um, one question which I'm going to address is the question of the category. So wh what is this, this the beneficiary, uh, this predestinative morpheme? Uh, it is not the possessive agreement, because we can see that the possessive agreement is expressed independently, and apparently it's not case, because the beneficiary, uh, the Predestinative forms, sorry, exist in three cases, and this is expressed in the paradigm, which is cited on the next page. Uh, so they exist in the nominative, accusative, and genitive. And you can see here that the case is expressed independently of the predestinative morpheme. Sometimes the case co accumulates with the possessive agreement, but that's normal for the Nenna's grammar. So this means that it's not the case, and it's not the possessive. What, what, what is it? Right? So that's the question which I'm going to discuss uh, in the remain, uh, remainder of this talk. Uh, but before I do that, let us just look quickly uh, at the syntactic distribution of these forms. Uh, you can see that there are three case forms of uh, predestinative nouns. There is the nominative, the accusative, and the genitive. The nominative functions as the subject or as the imperative object. Optionally, this is shown in seven, and these are the regular functions of the nominative case in the Nenna's grammar, so there's no, nothing special here. Okay. Uh, the accusative we have already seen, uh, that's like uh, example three, I gave you a book, right? So that's the accusative predestinative, it's the object. And the genitive predestinative functions, functions as some kind of uh, adjunct, meaning roughly as or for or instead. So these are examples in eight. This dog uh, became dog meant for us. Well, here it's not exactly adjunct. That's uh, some kind of secondary predicate in the combination with a copula verb. Uh, or 8b, we have bought this reindeer as food for ourselves. That's where you have the genitive predestinative. Okay? Oh. So these are the syntactic dis uh, uh, distributions of these forms. And now uh, returning to the question of category. So we, we have seen that the, these are not case, uh, predestinative morphemes are, are, are not cases, and they are not possessive. So what, what are they? Uh, in my previous work, I suggested that they actually express uh, nominal future tense uh, with nominal scope. But Nenets does not have nominal tense in non-possessive constructions. So this means that what we have here is that the tense is only expressed in possessive noun phrases in this language. This actually is not unique to Nenets because it has been claimed claimed in the literature that there are other languages which express uh, the distinction uh, of tense in nominals only in possessive constructions. And uh, some people have argued that there is an intrinsic link between possession and tense. 
uh, I'm not going to go into into this, but there are some theory internal reasons to believe that uh, this this should be the case. So. In this, in, uh, if, we, if we analyze it this way, it means that Nenets is the language which expresses tense opposition uh, in nouns only in possessive constructions, right? Um, and it's interesting to notice that in possessive noun, in non-possessive noun phrase, the tense uh, usually takes scope over the reference of the noun phrase itself, the property which, uh, to which it refers, right? But in possessive constructions, we do have two semantic predicates. On the one hand, you have the, uh, the property denoted by the head noun itself, and on the other hand, you have the possessive relationship. And it has been noticed in the literature that tense in noun phrases can take scope uh, over either of these two predicates, uh, sort of independently of each other, right? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Judith Tonhauser suggested that there are several uh, potential uh, situation times which can be localized with respect to time within the, uh, within the interpretation of the noun phrase. You, you can have the time at which the whole NP is interpreted, T and P, she calls it. You can have the time at which the, pro uh, the property den denoted by the noun is true of the individual uh, expressed by this noun, T nominal, she calls it, and you have the time at which the poss possessive relationship within the noun phrase is true, T pos, she calls it. And then, we c uh, it has been noticed that languages actually fall into two types depending on how tense in, is interpreted in possessive phrases. In the first type of languages, uh, I mean the languages which do have the temporal morphology of nouns, in the first type, uh, time-oriented markers scope, uh, can scope over either of the two relevant predicates, either T nom or T so there is a potential ambiguity in the interpretation of the noun phrase. To show it, uh, have a look at example 9. It's uh, from a um, language called Guarani. Um, the claim here that this, no uh, this noun phrase, my former house, is ambiguous. Okay, so what this example can mean uh, is this. On the first interpretation, the speaker is seeing the house which uh, she used to own, which means that the past morpheme on the noun only locates the possessive time. Okay. On the second interpretation, the speaker is seeing something which she owns right now, but which is not the house, which used to be a house. Right? So, for example, the speaker is looking at the ruins of, of the destroyed house and saying, well, these are my ruins, basically. But what they say, instead they say, this is my former house. Okay? So, in this case, the time morpheme, the past tense, only takes scope over, uh, over the nominal time, not the possessive time. So, these are the languages of the first type, which show this kind of ambiguity in possessive phrases. Uh, but then there are languages of the second type where there is no such an ambiguity and it seems that the tense morpheme in possessive phrases only takes scope over the possessive relationship. For, for instance, the claim is, and Martin can correct me if this is wrong, the claim is that in Somali this noun phrase, uh, my former students, which is cited here, which I will not pronounce, can only mean the students who used to be mine but are no longer my, mine, but it cannot mean my deceased students. Okay, so in, the, in, uh, in this language, the Past, uh, past 10 morpheme only locates the time of the possessive relationship. And apparently Tendrenenes belongs to this type. It's very similar to Somali in, in, in this respect. So only the possessive relationship is relativized with respect to time. So uh, I show this in 10. In example 10, 10, you have yesterday I gave you a book and tomorrow I will give you a book. Uh, in both cases, the predestinative morpheme on the object book indicates that the possessive relationship between me and the book will start after uh, the time of the of the event. So after the time I gave I gave the book uh, 
to you yesterday and after the time I will give you the book tomorrow, okay? Uh, and, and, and nothing else. The predestinatives can in fact exhibit ambiguity because the uh, nominal time can also be located in the future with respect to uh, event time together with the possessive relation. But uh, the predestinative morpheme never uh, requires that. It's some kind of possibility. So if we look at example 11, a doctor for us arrived. It does, in fact, uh, exhibit ambiguity, uh, but a different kind. Uh, it can be understood as the individual is already a doctor, but not our doctor, right? In, the, in, in this ca case, only the time of the possessive relationship is in the future with respect to the time of the noun phrase. It can also mean that the individual is not a doctor at the event time, and consequently, consequently it's not our doctor. So, for example, we're talking about the student who is studying to be a doctor, and we know that when he finishes to st uh, his study, he will be our doctor. So, in this case, both the possessive relationship and the nominal time are in the future with respect to the event time. However, what it cannot mean, it cannot uh, have this interpretation C. It cannot mean an individual with whom uh, we are already standing in some kind of possessive relationship, but he's not a doctor. Right? So that, that's presumably what, what you have in Guarani, but not in this language. So this shows that uh, T pos must be in the future. Whether T nom is in the future or not depends on the context, on the semantics of, of the verb and some, some other things. But the encoded meaning of the predestinative morpheme is that the possessive relationship is in the future uh, with respect to the event time. Wow. Okay, all right, uh, I think, well, uh, I haven't even started talking about the interesting stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just go very quickly through the remain, uh, remainder of this section. Uh, another claim I, I'm making here is that um, the speaker believes that the predestinative entity is meant to become the beneficiary's possession subsequent to the event described by the sentence, but predestinatives cannot denote an entity which is not meant to become uh, the beneficiary's possession. This means that if you say something like, I gave you a book to keep, in, or I gave you a library book, this cannot be expressed by means of the predestinative construction, because the this sentence presupposes that you are not going to become the possessor of the book, basically. Uh, this is again shown uh, in 12. So if you want to say something like, I gave you a book, but it's mine. So basically, I just gave you a book as a temporary, uh, for the temporary usage, but not uh, meaning that it will become your possession. You cannot use the predestinative of construction. You have to use the regular data. Um, indirect object. Okay. Um, okay, I'll probably skip uh, the next point, 13, uh, and go to the examples 14. Uh, they illustrate uh, another point which Tonhauser made with respect to the uh, language she investigated, Guarani, namely that the temporal morphemes on nouns in this language have the change of state meaning property, as she calls it. Uh, this means that uh, they do not only indicate that the relevant property is true at certain time t, but also that it is false uh, in other times. And this is also true for tundra nenets, because the predestinative morpheme indicates that the possessive relationship is located in the future with respect to the main event, and uh, it is false at the time uh, at which the noun phrase is interpreted. This means uh, that you cannot use the predestinative construction to render the meaning, uh, I brought you your book which I had borrowed. 
right? Because uh, this presupposes that you, the beneficiary, uh, has been already standing in the possessive relationship with, with, the, with, with this book. And what the predestinacy of morphine indicates is this possessive relationship has to start after the event of the main verb. This also means that example 14a, a passport for you arrived, can only be used uh, about uh, a very new passport which has been issued to you and which you receive for the first time. If, for example, you already have a passport and then you send it to a consulate for a visa and then they, they return it back to you, you cannot use this, this construction to describe the situation. Okay? And the same with uh, 14b, he brought a sister to me. Again, this cannot be used with respect to your actual sister, which you, uh, some, some, somebody wh whom you already have as a sister. This can all only be used sort of metaphorically about someone whom you will adopt as a sister, but not about your actual sister. This, of course, implies that predestinatives are very infrequent, although they're not completely excluded, on relational nouns which denote the entities uh, that stand in a permanent possessive relationship, such as certain kinship terms. Uh, again, well, that's the same point, basically. In 15a, a mother for me arrived. It does not mean your, your actual mother. It means somebody who, who, who will become like a mother for you. And I painted an arm for you, uh, I cannot uh, use it uh, on somebody, uh, talking about somebody's arm. Uh, what it can mean, it can only mean that I made a sort of artificial arm for you and ga ga gave it to you. Right? So that will be your new pos possession. Um, right. Okay, I guess I will skip the next two points, but basically su summarize the uh, temporal uh, meaning of the predestinative as follows. This is on top of page seven. Uh, the basic temp tense related contribution of the predestinative morpheme uh, is as follows. For an entity X denoted by the predestinative NP, the possessive relation is meant to become true of X at a time uh, T possessive, which is subsequent to the NP time NP, but is false at any other time prior to, uh, to this T. And the time of existence of X must inclu include T possessive. I did not talk about it because I, I don't have much time, but you can believe me that that's the case. And this, this also corresponds to what we find in other languages. Uh, now, with all this, the question is, um, can we then call predestinatives uh, nominal future? Uh, and and that, that's my uh, main question here. I have to say that Don Hauser uh, says that um, in order for the morpheme on nouns to be called tense, it has to uh, have exactly it has to have uh, exactly the same meaning related contribution as. Uh, temporal morphemes on verbs. So you have to compare the, property, uh, the properties of nominal tenses with the properties of nominal, uh, verbal tenses. And if they're the same, then we can say that nom nominal tenses are instantiated in exactly the same category. And she cites several properties of nominal tenses, uh, five properties actually, uh, of verbal tenses, sorry, which serve her as a checklist for nominal tenses as well. Uh, there are five properties and um, among these five properties, three properties are actually relevant for nenets, and they uh, show that, uh, according to these properties, this predestinative morpheme can be called nominal tense. Namely, uh, predestinatives do not exhibit any lexical restrictions. That is true. They, they are relevant for the whole class of nouns. They do not co-occur with other tenses within the nominal domain. And that temporal modifiers may constrain their semantic contribution. This is something I shall show in 19, and this is something which is also observed in verbal tenses. So in 19, uh, the translation is our next year's doctor arrived yesterday. So what is going on here? There is this NP internal modifier next years, and this 
uh, modify actually restricts the meaning of the predestinative morpheme. The doctor will become our doctor only next year, not immediately after the event when, uh, of his arrival, right? And that's exactly what happens in verbal tenses as well. And according to Tonhauser, that this might indicate that it is a verbal, uh, it is it is a true tense. However, there are two other properties uh, which she lists and which do not seem to apply here. In particular, canonical verbal tenses do not exhibit this change of state meaning property, which I discussed earlier, and we saw that predestinatives do. So according to Tonhauser's argument, they will not be true tenses. And canonical verbal tenses resolve the reference time to a contextually determined time salient in discourse, as we saw it before. But again, predestinatives do not do that. Uh, they only localize possessive relationship in the future with respect to the time of the noun phrase itself, but not with respect to a contextually given time. Uh, this, for example, you can see in... 20b. The example here is, when I returned yesterday, Masha had already made me a coat. Right? So what we have here is that the reference time, the time about which we are talking, is yesterday when I returned. I'm talking about the second clause here. Uh, the event time, the time of this making this code, is the time which precedes the reference time, and the time of the uh, when the NP is interpreted is this is the same as the event time, and the possessive relationship is actually localized with respect to this time of the NP, not with respect to the reference time yesterday. So basically, the possessive relationship is supposed to start right uh, after. Um, the event of making the code, not after I, I arrived yesterday. Okay, so it, it looks like, according to this property, this predestinative morpheme does not behave like a verbal tense because that's not what, what verbal ten, uh, tenses do. Moreover, and this is probably even more important, uh, predestinatives do not conform to the uh, definition Tonhauser uh, gives for the nominal tense to begin with. Because uh, what she says is this, calling the markers nominal tenses suggests that they behave like verbal tenses in that they contribute to the location of the time at which a noun phrase is interpreted. So basically the assumption here is that the verbal tense uh, locates the time at which the, uh, the predication expressed by the verb is true, and the nominal tense locates the time at which the, uh, the noun phrase is true. But we saw that predestinatives do not do that. They do not locate the time at which the noun phrase is true. They locate the time of the possessive relationship, which holds within the, this noun phrase. So that's something different. Uh, I believe that if we do on, on, on if we do talk of them as tense, then it probably makes more sense to contribute, uh, to call them, Im uh, to compare them with embedded tenses, not with the tenses of the main verb, uh, right? Because basically what they do, they, they provide the temporal interpretation of the embedded predication. Notice that predestinatives are never the main predicates of the clause. They're only found on argument nouns, right? So if we compare them uh, with tenses found on verbs, it makes more sense to compare them with tenses found on the verbal forms which, are, which occur in embedded contexts. For example, the tenses found on non-finite forms or as, as, a, as embedded tenses ra rather than the tenses found on main predicates. And on this analysis, what we do have he here then, we have a tense, uh, an embe embedded future, which locates uh, the time internal uh, of, the, of the predicate internal to the, uh, to the noun phrase, rather than the time of the noun phrase itself, right? Oops. Right. Okay. So that would be the tense analysis. However, what... Uh, there is more to that, and I will go through the second part very quickly uh, because that's, this is quite complicated. Uh, but basically, um, the point is that uh, there are certain properties of the predestinative phrases which cannot easily be explained uh, under the tense analysis, even if we talk about embedded tenses. Namely, it looks like predestinative morphemes do contribute to the uh, interpretation of the whole phrase, even though this 
contribution is not really tense related. Uh, well, the first claim here is they actually make the noun phrase uh, non-specific, right? Uh, the, well, there are various definitions of specificity. The one, the one I'm using here is given at the bottom of page eight, uh, but you probably don't have to uh, to look at it right now. What uh, I can show you is that predestinative noun phrase is non-specific uh, noun phrase according to the standard specificity tests, right? Uh, for example, it cannot refer uh, uh, to a referent which stands uh, in some kind of anchored relationship with an already mentioned referent in the discourse. That's one of the definitions of specificity, actually. So if you look at example 21, uh, the context here, I bought five guns. And then the continuation of this context. I will give you one of the guns. Right? If uh, what you mean is that one of these guns uh, is actually selected from this set of guns mentioned in the previous context, then you cannot use the predestinative construction. What you have to say is that you have to use the, the regular dative indirect object. Right? But the predestinative object cannot stand in this subset relation uh, with the set mentioned previously in, in the discourse. That's one of the tests, the standard tests for specificity. Uh, the second one is shown in 22. Um, well, basically, uh, after so-called intentional verbs, verbs like look, uh, seek, uh, and, and so on, uh, we do normally find two possible readings of indefinite NP, specific one and non-specific one. So if you say something, I'm looking for a dog, right? Uh, this has two readings. There is a specific reading when you are looking for a specific dog, and there is a reading when, uh, which means that I'm looking for any, 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 any dog, right? Uh, and according to this test, predestinances are clearly non-specific because uh, the only reading you, ca you can get here is that you are looking for a any, any dog you, you, you can find, basically. You're not looking for a, for, for a, for a specific dog. And this, uh, this can be tested by means of um, uh, looking at the definite anaphores, uh, referring back to the sentence. Okay, I will not go into this either. Uh, another thing is that the syntactic distribution of predestinatives actually uh, confirms that they are not specific. Uh, it is known that only specific indefinites can function as topics in the sentence, right? But predestinatives are totally excluded from the syntactic constructions uh, which are triggered by topicalization in this language. For, for example, in this language, the object agreement is triggered by topical objects. And um, if you take a regular object, it either triggers agreement on the verb or not, depending on whether it's topical or not. So this is shown in 23a. If you say something like, I broke, I broke your boat, there is this optional object agreement on the verb, and this only occurs when the object is topical. However, if you say something like, I made you a boat, uh, with the predestinative object, object agreement becomes totally impossible. Okay, that's pretty strictly un un ungrammatical. Predestinative objects do not trigger object agreement. <laughs> And predestinative objects do not passivize. And again, we know that in this language, passivization very much depends on information structures tri triggered by top top topicalization. But uh, it's not possible to passivize the predestinative object. So all these tests show that predestinatives are non non specific, right? Uh, and what, basically what I'm suggesting here, uh, I'm suggesting that they have property uh, interpretation. What they mean, they do not denote an individual, they, de they denote, uh, denote a property um, type complement. And it has been argued in the literature that there are certain constructions in many languages which do um, 
and use this property like an in interpretation. But what exactly it is depends on the language and also on the lexical semantic of the verb and on the nature of the construction itself. One analogy I could find is in modern Greek, uh, which I'm still hoping to investigate further. In this language we do have um, a, specific, a very special construction type, uh, which is called future-free relative clauses with WH words, and they're shown in 25. Uh, so here you have something like, I have already bought what I'm going to wear at the party. Right? And the properties of these relative clauses are mentioned here on your handout. As you can see here, they are very similar to the properties of the predestinative construction. In both cases, the, there is a more syntactic restriction to the future tense. These relative clauses in, in Greek cannot exist in other tenses, only in the future. There is, uh, there is a resistance to passivization and topicalization. Uh, there is incompatibility with specific WH question words. And in, in both cases, uh, this uh, object phrase is selected by a very uh, closed class of verbs. I'll, talk a little bit uh, about Nens uh, further in this respect. So basically what the analysis of this Greek uh, construction suggests uh, is that the meaning of this relative clause is property-like. It does not denote a particular individual, a particular dress, but the whole class of objects. And the, uh, the, this paper analyzes uh, the verbs uh, which can select this type of relative clauses as verbs which uh, alternatively uh, can take um, future orientated uh, objects modified by the adjunct of the type as. So basically the, constru uh, the verbs which can license the construction in 25A also license the constructions such as I have bought dress as my Sunday dre dress, and this is obviously future-oriented. Well, my claim is that the, the meaning of the Nenets predestinative is, is exactly the same as uh, the meaning of these relative clauses in uh, Greek. Uh, so, I, following uh, this analysis, I suggest that they actually denote the property of indeterminate no num number B, X, Y's X. So this means that the meaning of the first uh, example we we'll look at, we we'll looked at the example. Uh, yeah, the example three, uh, which is I gave you a book, can in fact be paraphrased as I gave what is meant to, uh, or what will be your book. That's what it literally means. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll skip this as well. Uh, all right. Oh, there's a lot more to say here. Um, I'll try to skip this. Yeah, well, returning to the, to the question of uh, selecting verbs, I said that in Greek, uh, these relative clauses are selected by a very close class of verbs. And this is exactly what happens in, in Tundranen's predestinatives as well. Basically, predestinative subjects occur only with intransitive verbs of uh, appearances, such as the verbs enter, arrive, appear, be born, right? We, we have already seen examples. But they are generally impossible with intransitive verbs which denote the termination of existence or do not bring about a possessive relationship. For example, if you look at 27, what you can say, you can, it was the predestinative construction, you can say a doctor meant for you entered a yurt, this is fine, uh, but what you cannot say a doctor meant for us is still studying, using the predestinative verb. Or you can, and you cannot say a doctor meant for us died. Apparently because the verb here does not bring about a, possess a possessive relation between the beneficiary and the predestinative entry. And the same concerns uh, predestinative objects. Predestinative objects are only licensed 
by verbs of creation, such as make, write, cook, and so on. The verbs uh, which indicate the change of location, such as give, bring, buy, and so on, so on, transfer on information, or discovery, find, meet. Uh, however, they are absolutely impossible with verbs of destruction and manipulation, which do not imply uh, the beginning of the possessive relationship between the predestinative entity and the beneficiary. So in 29, I show that something like, I broke a boat meant for you, is impossible uh, to say using the predestinative construction. Or you love your future husband, is impossible, uh, uh, is impossible to. This is because, again, the verb does not presuppose that uh, the event it describes brings about the possessive relationship between the beneficiary and the predestinative entity. Um, right. Another point here is that, well, uh, this actually bring, uh, brings the predestinances uh, and the category they express closer to the model meaning rather than the, me the, the temporal meaning, because we, we know that um, tense is not licensed. Uh, tense, ten, a regular tense on verbs is not licensed by the high, by the higher verb. However, the dependent moods, for example, the subjunctive, uh, need, needs to be licensed by, by, by the verb. And there are many different analyses of su subjunctives which actually looked at the semantics of the se selecting verb and try, try to make, 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 make sense out, out of it. But the point is that uh, only the model categories are supposed to be uh, dependent on the semantics of the higher verb. This means that predestinatives in this sense are much closer to, to the model meaning. <laughs> Uh, than the temporal meaning. I'm actually suggesting here that uh, they uh, do, they can be analyzed as expressing some kind of modal category, probably subjunctive or irrealis. Uh, and, uh, and in this sense, they can be compared uh, with the verbal categories in languages which do. Uh, the so-called tenseless languages, which do not express the category of tense as such, but divide the uh, the, uh, the verbs into uh, two classes, basically realis and irrealis. So, uh, in a similar manner, predestinatives divide the, the class of uh, possessed nouns in in nenets in, in, into two sub subtypes: the realis or non-predestinative and the irrealis or, pre or predestinatives. Okay. Uh, well, to conclude this part of the talk, uh, I'll, I'll go to the last page right now, although I, di I did skip quite a lot of argumentation here, but basically what I said in the second part of, of the talk is that, well, predestinatives do affect the temporal interpretation of the possessive relationship within the noun phrase, that's true, that's what we, uh, we saw to begin with, but they also affect the interpretation of the whole noun phrase, not only of the possessive relationship, but of the whole noun phrase, even though they do not, do not change the time at which uh, the whole noun phrase is, is true. Instead, they change its referential status. They, they make it non-specific, right? Uh, they contribute this non-specific property interpretation. And they also indicate that the epistemic agent, the beneficiary, is not committed to the pragmatic existence of the, of the entity. I, I did not talk about that, but believe me, that's true. Uh, so yes, th this means, uh, as I said, that the meaning of the predestinative uh, construction contributes to the interpretation of the possessive NP, uh, but it's comparable to the meaning of the dependent uh, mood, subjunctive or irrealis, which normally indicates the lack of commitment uh, to the truth of the proposition on the part of this some kind of epistemic agent, which is normally uh, the, uh, the subject of the main clause. So from this point of view, it, it, can, it can be called mood, right? So going back to the question of category now, uh, well, what, what do we want to say at the end? Is it tense or is it mood? So we did see that it does have some properties of tense, but uh, it's probably not the regular tense. But we also saw that it has some properties of mood. 
right? So I believe that the question, uh, the answer to this question depends on basically on how, how we define the nominal tense, whether the nominal tense is supposed to look inside the noun phrase and take scope over the predicate which is internal to the noun phrase, or the nominal tense is supposed to temporarily locate the, the whole noun phrase, sort of look outside. Uh, and as, as I said earlier, there are two different answers to, the, to this question on Tonhauser's account. Uh, the nominal tense must uh, affect the whole phrase. Okay, so on her account, predestinatives are not going to be tense, uh, nom nominal tenses. So in the, indeed, the, the, this makes her general claim true that we do not have evidence from any language that there are, tense, uh, there are tenses on noun, if you, if you define them that, that way. But even on Tonhauser, the, Tonhauser's definition, predestinatives can be called nominal tam, except that they are not tenses but, but, but moods, because they do affect the whole interpretation of the noun phrase, and as I said, they can be compared to uh, the tam system in the languages which do not have tense as such, but divide the class of verbs into realis and irrealis. Okay? So that would be one, one possible solution. On the other hand, if we uh, do not follow Tonhauser's definition uh, of nominal tense, but rather go with Norlinger and Sadler, who say that the tense on nouns does not actually have to affect the whole noun phrase, what uh, is required here uh, is required that it do, uh, the tense affects the temporal interpretation of uh, relevant to the noun phrase in some way. Right? And on this definition, it, it's perfectly possible to apply the category of tense to the possessive relationship only. Right? Uh, so on their definition, I, be, I believe the predestinatives can be classified as, as, nominal, ten, as nominal tenses. But I also have to notice that a similar understanding is found in other literature. For example, in the papers by Le Carme, who uh, analyzed Somali. Uh, and the, she actually argues for exactly this second uh, understanding of nominal tense, and, more, and moreover, she says that there is no pr uh, principal difference between nominal and verbal tense. Basically, tense is just the category of, la of human language, and then it applies to the, now, uh, to the phrases of dif different types. Well, she follows some, some syntactic assumptions, which I do not necessarily um, agree with, uh, but um, anyway, that's something, something to look to look uh, at. Uh, so she says that uh, nouns uh, basically contain nominals, so, uh, rather than noun phrases, contain the, uh, the uh, syntactic note, syntactic position called tense position, T, and then of course it, uh, it's realized on a language particular basis. In some languages like uh, Nenets and Somali, there, there will be the actual morphological marker merged with this position. In other languages, this position would be phonologically um, empty. Okay. Uh, but she also makes another interesting point, namely that um, the tense, uh, well, she argues for the, some kind of uh, parallelism in the structure of the clause and the noun phrase and says that if in clauses you do have some kind of chain, um, well, the syntactic dependency between the tense phrase and uh, the whole clause, the complementizer phrase, this, in the same way in noun phrases you have the relationship between nominal tense and the D note, sort of the higher note in the interpretation of the noun phrase, which is responsible for the referentiality. So basically what she says is that there is an intrinsic link between the nominal tense and the referentiality of the clause. And she cites very arguments for, from Somali. Uh, she, in particular, she looked at the model effects associated with tense morphology on nouns in these languages, and noticed that in that language, in, Som in Somali, uh, the model distinction which is associated with uh, nominal tense is the one related to evidentiality. Basically, uh, it translates into the opposition visible uh, versus non-visible, which kind of makes sense, makes sense for nouns because that's, well, that's how we perceive objects, as is visible as non-visible. Uh, 
so in the languages which uh, where nominal tense has some kind of uh, evidentiality meaning uh, the past tense usually uh, is usually associated with non visibility on nouns and the present tense on nouns is usually associated with visibility what tandra nenets shows though uh, that there is another model dimension to the temporal morphology on nouns. It's not necessarily evidential in nature. It's not about visibility or non-visibility. It's rather about uh, realis uh, versus irrealis interpretation. But it also shows the deep connection between tense on nouns and the temporal uh, and, and the referential interpretation of the whole noun, noun phrase and um, sort of model con contribution which this morphology makes. Uh, so that's my basic conclusion at that point. But I, I guess the basic point is the one which Tonhauser makes, uh, namely that uh, well, there are these time-oriented uh, markers on nouns in various languages, and uh, many people say that well, they do instantiate the category of tense, but. If you start looking at them more closely, it looks like they have very, very different meanings in, diff in different languages. And to which extent they do instantiate one and the same category is, is, of course, a big question. But what we really need, we really need to look very closely at the semantics of these uh, markers ac across languages before we actually can make generalizations on the uh, validity of nominal tense as a grammatical category. Yeah, I guess that, that that's all I wanted to say. There, there, there are references, well, a lot of them, they are available upon request. I didn't put them here on the handout. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and we have half an hour for questions. Yes. Thank you very much. It was a very exciting conversation. Um, you started off by saying that these are TAM categories, and you, you look at the tense, you said tense does quite a right, and then you look at mood, but I was wondering whether you look at aspect at all. Yeah. Some, some of the discussion you have, to me, sounded that you know, aspectual distinctions are quite parallel to that. Yeah. The distinction between, between locating an event in the flow of time as tense, but looking at the internal constituency of the event. In terms of aspects, yeah. Yeah. The, the sensitivity to lexical semantic distinctions we have that with aspect, in particular when you look at axioms and verbal aspect, um, and and what you don't get here, I think, with the modality, with the realist irrealist, is is the change element, and I think again their aspect is probably more interesting. Um, there's, there's work by my former PhD student Peter Nichols who looked at tense and aspect in Siswati, mm. um, and there, there is, it looks like aspectual categories which look similar to that, in that specific important change because of alternative terminology, but it is, it's, 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 a, it, you know, it's events which, of which it said that it didn't hold in the past, but yeah, now, yeah, it doesn't yeah, hold now, yeah. it will hold in the future, so you have this exactly this, mm -hmm. you know, this change from one mm -hmm. to the other, and again, that, that mm. so, so yeah, that's exactly what Tonhauser says about Guarani. She actually analyzes this temporal morpheme in Guarani as an aspect marker, uh, at least in, in some of her um, papers, and exactly based on this change of state property, because true tenses do not do not have this this property; only aspects do. And I think this will work here, uh, but again, there is the question of. What what are we talking about? What, what relationship are we talking about? Are we talking only about the possessive relationship, or are we, are we talking about the interpretation of the whole noun phrase? If we, you talk only about the possessive relationship, I believe you you can probably argue that that, that it's something aspect aspect like. But if you look at the whole uh, the whole phrase, then uh, I cannot really see any aspectual characteristics of the of the meaning of the whole phrase. It's, much more compar comparable to to the mo to the mood, as I, as I was trying to trying to say. But yes, uh, you're absolutely right. But that, that would not contradict uh, the last point I made here, uh, following Le Carme, uh, that tense could be a universal um, 
category typical of uh, nouns in the same way as verbs, uh, because we, we know that the temporal interpretation of clauses uh, or verbs uh, comes from several sources. It can come from temporal morphology on verbs. It can come from lexical temporal modifiers. It can come from the aspectual information. But it all merges, well, in her analysis at least, it all merges within this tempor temporal note in the structure of the clause. And presumably she could argue that the, sa the same thing happens uh, in noun phrases as well. Yeah, so it, it all depends on, the, on your definition, really. That's, I guess, the basic point. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it does have some aspectual characteristics. Yes. Uh, I think you're presuming there is a uh, uh, distinction, some kind of universal category between noun and adjective. Mm. I guess. Right. OK. Oh, that, that was the, oh, that, that was the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. Nenets is an is a, is a endangered language, isn't it, of, of Soviet rights. So is it under the influence of Russian? I presume there's been quite a bit of influence yeah. of Russian. How widespread are these um, predestinative yeah. markers? And, how often are they now replaced by a sort of more, you know, relative clauses or the other type of constructions of Russian yeah. type? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question actually. Yeah, I guess what I'm describing here is the language of the older generation and the more competent, so to say, spe speakers of the language. That's true. That speakers, young younger speakers and speakers who are less competent, they would use the alternative construction, which is perfectly available in this language. You would simply use the uh, the dative indirect object, for example, with di transitive verbs. Yes, I, I, I mean, I do not have any statistics, but I do believe that uh, we can notice some kind of decrease in the usage of these constructions. Oh well, that that's very theory internal, as I as 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 I, as I as I said, and I'm not really competent to answer this question with any depth. Uh, but basically, the idea here is that, uh, as I said, there is a ch uh, they presuppose that there is a certain chain uh, relation between the D note and the t and the and the tense note, and app app apparently. And the claim here is that uh, somehow tense is only found on uh, referential uh, DPs, uh, and referential and specific DPs, which do have the um, D note and possessive note uh, fill, 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 filled in. On the other hand, the non-specific DPs, the, the, the claim is, uh, cannot have independent temporal interpretation. Okay, okay. O only, only the specific uh, NP, uh, D DPs uh, do have the tense, which is independent on the tense of the main verb. Right, so that, that's, that's how it works. So, so there's no kind of attempt to that's a purely formal account, but the, the, the claim is, I mean, in neutral terms, the, the claim is that uh, only the, uh, the specific uh, DP, DPs can have independent temp temporal interpretation. Uh, then it actually shows that there, that that might be, well be true what they what they said, but then it actually shows that the reverse is not necessarily true. That uh, as we can see here, non-specific uh, and peace can also have the independent te temporal interpretation. Have you read what John Said has written about these things in mm, No. Um, I guess it's you because he he does 
um, take on what the camp says about this, this whole notion of tense, which mm -hmm. I do sort of agree with him to a certain extent, because it, there's more sort of going on. I mean, he looks mm -hmm. more from a sort of pragmatic perspective, right. and the way that these are used, rather than um, a sort of syntactic or a mm -hmm. sort of sentence internal um, sort of tense way of looking at it, because you do, you can have both the this um, sort of remote and, and non-remote sort of determining used in, in the sense it really is sort of dependent on the, the sort of pragmatic view. Yeah, 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 okay, thank you. And you, you get it even with, um, with, I mean, it's, the, the, the classic example is like time, literally saying the time, what time is it? If you, in Somali to say, you know, it's five o'clock, you use the, the word for five and the, and the determinant. So five o'clock, if I'm going to meet you at five o'clock later today, I say shantak. If I met you at five o'clock and it's already seven o'clock, so talking about five o'clock in the past, I say shanti. Mm -hmm. If you're saying about now, if you say what time is it, and I say it's five o'clock, I say washanti. I'm using the past, the, the past one to actually sort of say what time it is now. Mm. And um, it's, there are all sorts of things going on, but more, I mean, in terms of semantics with adjectives, for example, there is you do have the past sort of tense of the verb to be with adjectives with, with things with this sort of remote um, e ending. Um, but there, there is, there's sort of, there's quite a lot more to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Work to be done on the Somali. I mean, sure. I've done a lot of work on it and it's very useful. And, uh, sure. Uh, but I'll pass you on John Save's article. Thank you. It gives you a bit right. more sort of right. about the, um, yeah. the usage of these things. Um, Thank you. Sorry to come in again. Um, with the Shanta and the Shanti, um, isn't this also used for the, uh, the exist, for example, this and that? Would you? Um, not, well, it depends on, I mean, in terms of English, I mean, when I'm teaching, sometimes I say, because this, this E ending, this sort of remote, yeah. is sometimes, like, for example, if, if we were talking about, um, you know, the paper that, that um, Irina gave today, you might say, if I'm talking a book later, oh, that paper Irina gave, that paper. That's where in Somali you use this, this E ending. But it's for this, when you're sort of, um, sort of pointing to, the, you know, this paper, this, this bit of paper, yeah. then you, you would use a different one, which is a sort of determined, um, what kind of dan. So you've got, an, and you've got a specific sort of this, but the E, I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's the equivalent of what we would say that or even this. In, yeah. But it's not a particular sort of. But isn't it this visible as opposed to invisible, as, as I mentioned at the end? I mean. Or partly at least. No, you could. I mean, you can use either of the determinants, the, the A and the E, for mm. visible and, and mm. invisible. Mm. Um, it's. There is. I mean, a, a lot of the time, it, there is this sort of thing that we were talking about earlier, that that sort of past sense. Yeah. Sort of anaphoric sort of type thing going on, I think. In the oh, it is invisible. <laughs> Which, yes, yeah. Um, but it could be... Um, I suppose, yes, I mean, in certain cases, it would be that, yeah. It, it is, I mean, certainly the Somali thing, there's a lot more... It's, and also how it how they relate when you have noun phrases in a position so more than one noun phrase basically in a, in a one one noun with these things in a phrase where they they sort of interact with the even that mm. so, oh you can have both on what oh. you can have both yeah right yeah and um, and it's also it's I mean because there was a thing about it not being on the I can't remember now, about not being on the on these sort of spatial data, this, this and that. But there is an ending which no one's actually sort of, it does seem to be there, and she does have it on, you know, this one that we were talking about. Um, and rather than just this, this one sort of generally. Thank you. you know, it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? <laughs>
just had a quick question about um, Tom House's property. One of them is on page seven. He said that um, you can't, they can't co occur with our target tenses. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, just, um, it's not about to embarrass, I was just thinking about English. You can say something like, um, my ex wife to be. <laughs> so that, but that's why it's not a tense. <laughs> So that's why it's not... Well, she claims that uh, verbal tenses, I mean, th these are the properties of verbal tenses which she's trying to apply to the noun phrase, right? And she says that two verbal tenses, true verbal tenses, do not co-occur. I'm not actually sure that it's 100% true for all languages, but that's what she said anyway. So you can't be past and future at the same time. Although, well, I mean, historically, historically you can, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's what she says. No, but in, in, in English, in languages like, like English, you have uh, these morphemes like X and to be, or um, modifiers like former or um, future, my future husband or whatever. Uh, and the claim is that they do contribute to the interpreta temporal interpretation of the noun phrase, but they're not grammaticalized tenses. And that's why they're much more flexible, really, and much more, much more lexi lexicalized. Right. Again, this would be compared uh, um, in in this view which I expressed you know, on, the, on the last page. Uh, they would be the claim would be that English, like all languages universally presumably, does have the category of tense in the noun phrase, except that it's phonologically null. This tense note is phonologically null. But what you can do, you can uh, express the temporal relationship in, within the noun phrase by means of these le lexicalized modifiers. That would be comparable to a language without grammatical tense on verbs, but where you actually uh, express temporal contribution of the sentence by means of adverbs, let's say, yesterday, tomorrow, or something like that. Yeah, but that, that's, that's what these people would say, I, pre I presume. I'm not saying that I agree with that, but the, the, that would be the, the claim. Sorry, Nancy, there is Lutz, and then I come back to you. Lutz. Yeah, 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 Lutz.
kind of tries to box it up. And yeah. So yeah. This is this, but how can you? Yeah. When, when we have, we genuinely have in in major language, in, in big languages. Yeah. Are, you know, spoken every you know by many people. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But that's what I mean. We don't have to go far. We don't have to go into into. Yeah, the but I guess the the question here is the difference between the grammaticalized tense and the temporal interpretation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in in every language, every clause is somehow temporally inter interpreted, yeah. well, more, more or less every clause. But not every language has grammaticalized category of tense. And what she is looking at, she's looking at the grammaticalized categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you? I didn't get why 29 is not good. Yeah, sorry, I had to go very quickly through this. Yes, so I, know. It was, I, uh, I was expecting it to be good. Oh, it's because, well, I actually skipped this, uh, the, uh, the, the, this part on the previous page. Uh, if you look at the page 11, what previous page here, yeah, what I'm suggesting here, that there are he heavy restrictions in the middle of the page. There are heavy restrictions on the lexical semantics of the verbs which select predestinates of subjects and objects. Okay. Well, the first one is what I talked about. The verb co-occurring with the predestinate of argument must denote an, an event which brings about the possessive relationship. Oh. Okay, and if you say something like you love your future husband, mm -hmm. you know, loving someone does not presuppose that you are going to start a possessive relationship yeah, yeah, with yeah, this yeah. entity, I guess. Well. <laughs> I guess that's very true. Uh, but th th that's, that depends on the lexical semantics of the verb. The verb which kind of denote that you are already standing in a possessive relationship, sort of, some, some kind of pragmatic, uh, pragmatic association with the entity yeah. can, cannot be used with the predestinance of object. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you, you found your future husband is fine, yeah. but you love your future husband is not fine. Okay. Because basically, when you say you found, you you, dis you describe the first encounter with the object, right? But not when you love. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I think that's enough. Uh, so we can thank Irina. Thank, thank you. Irina.